Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Madison Realty Capital, New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, Amtrust Title, Ariel Property Advisors, Customers Bank, Capital One Bank, Meridian Capital Group. Additional funding has been provided by grants from AVR Realty Company, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Colliers International NYC, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Real Estate Organization Handro Properties, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Castamatidis Red Apple Group, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Stonehenge NYC, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Meringoff Family Foundation, the Moynian Organization, Moynian Capital Partners, and these friends. Jamaica, Brooklyn, New York, TD Bank, Vice President of Marketing. I, I have Yvonne Riley Tepe. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. So tell me about the family going back many generations in Jamaica. Well, my grandparents and uh, before them, their parents are, to the best of my knowledge, Jamaican, born and raised. My sister is the historian, the historian in our family, of the family yes, yes, yes. And uh, one great grandmother owned a haberdashery, so she sold products to all the people in the neighborhood. And uh, I had fishermen in the family, farmers, uh, uh, all very gainfully employed. But I was surprised to see the women had jobs and uh, provided. So what about uh, grandma? My grandmother, um, Catherine Constable, could be seen as the medicine woman, if you will. The medicine Yeah, she probably would be arrested today for practicing medicine without a license. She told me the funniest story when I was growing up, that when she goes to the doctor, she doesn't waste time. She gets behind the curtains and she listens to the doctor's advice to patients so that she would know what to tell the neighbors when she went home. So, so grandma was the medicine person? Yes, yes. And what about grandpa? My grandfather owned a um, ironworks company and they made beautiful furniture, including rocking chairs and uh, coffee tables and stuff like that. My grandmother also had a, what we call a shop. So now let's go to your, your father. Tell yes. me about your dad. My dad owns a graphic arts company to this day. Um, very early in his teen years, his stepmother introduced him to someone in an apprenticeship, and he learned how to do at that time what's called sign painting. And through the years, that evolved into a graphic arts company. They do, you know, logo design and provide experiential marketing opportunities, including expo booths and printing of fabrics and billboards. And, and that's done in Jamaica. That's in Jamaica, yes. Okay, and mom? My mom is a stay home mom and was for all my life until she emigrated to the United States 23 years ago and she took a job at the Board of Education as a school food service helper. So mom lives here? Yes, both parents are here now. Uh, but you said dad still runs the business out of Jamaica? My sister and my brother have stayed in Jamaica and they run the business. My dad goes back and forth. He's a winter bird. He goes home when it gets cold and he's back in the so summer. So how did mom meet dad in Jamaica? Any, <laughs> any, any idea from the historian sisters? Yes, they grew up in the same yard and they all had different houses in this big yard. The grandparents were friends um, and he was her best friend until they married. 
I mean, still remained our best friends. But right. uh, yeah, so they were best friends, and he was her sounding board about matters of the heart. And eventually, they got married. So they've known each other their whole okay, lives. Okay. So now, tell me about your brothers and sisters, and how many there are, and where you are in that pecking order. Okay. There are nine biological kids in my family. I'm third to the last. And I say nine biological because I have to differentiate from all the friends who became siblings and cousins who came to live with us and other people that came to live with us because... I know we have that large family photo. Yes. I mean, if you add the non-biological family members, how many are there? I would say there are 14 because what? there are some friends that you just can't call friends anymore. They become okay. brother and sister. So tell me about the biological. Well, the oldest, Anthony, lives in Florida. And uh, my second sister, Marcia, unfortunately passed uh, 31 years ago. My sister, Patricia, works in the pathology. She's the head of the pathology department up at Mount Sinai. Uh, my brother, Franklin, works at uh, a, nas a local hotel. He's a concierge. My sister, Christine, studied architecture, moved, and she's a sculptress and a painter. She moved back to Jamaica. My brother Noel is in the orthotics business. He provides wheelchair coaching and training and uh, teaching people how, you know, once they're injured, how to move on with their lives. And then there's me. And then... We'll get to you. In yeah, a we'll get to me okay. in a minute. <laughs> My younger sister, Nadine, um, owns a uh, cookie company, and she lives up in Poughkeepsie with her family. And my youngest brother, Dennis, lives in Florida but works in Jamaica. Interesting, but it works for him and his family. So tell me, who came over first to America? My brother, Frank, came here when he was about 17, and he went to live with my dad's stepmom in Philadelphia, and he uh, started working and going to school, and then he was followed by my sister, Patricia, who came here and initially lived in Queens, where my brother joined her. And then they went out on their own, got an apartment in Brooklyn, and one by one, we all started coming. So when did the number three out of nine come? You? Me. Oh, 20, wow. I was 21 years old, so that's going back... 32, 32 years. 32 years, yeah, wow. So, so how did you decide to come to the Big Apple from Jamaica? Well, I was in college in Jamaica. I studied nutrition and dietetics there, but there was no uh, bachelor degree program on the island at that time. How did you decide you wanted to be involved in nutrition and health? It was, um, I liked cooking from high school, and I wanted to be a chef. And my dad tried to steer me away from that a little bit, and he'll admit to that. And so I thought the closest thing that I could do to culinary arts on the island was to study uh, nutrition and dietetics because I wanted to impact people's lives through food. And uh, following that, I moved here to study culinary arts. Where did you move originally in Brooklyn? On Bedford Avenue between President and Carroll, 1610 Bedford Avenue. So how did you find out about the New York City tech who has a great uh, hospitality program and food arts. I was looking for an affordable institution and started doing my research when I was in Jamaica. And I applied here to CUNY and got accepted to the second choice, which was the Staten Island University to study English. That wasn't my choice at all. So I went over to City Tech to ask why wasn't I accepted, and they said the program is very competitive. I spoke with someone in the registration department, and he said, but, you know, since you have other courses that you already bring, and I transferred some credits in, let's see if they have room. And they sent me to speak with a woman, Professor Julia Jordan, who to this day remains my mentor. And she found room in the program for me, and it just happened. So when did you start New York Tech? A spring of 89, and I studied full-time for three and a half years, but I had part-time jobs. And so what kind of part-time jobs? I was a tutor in the Sikh department, and then I did a little private tutoring on my own. And then in my senior year, I was allowed to get a work permit to work, uh, and I worked at Merrill Lynch in the, in the executive dining room there under the sh uh, chef David Gonzalez, and I was his pastry chef, and... So you were a pastry chef. I you, am. You, you hid that from me. You never told me. <laughs> yes. Yes, I'm a trained pastry chef. So you graduated what year? 90. I graduated in 92. So at this time, you know, you were a pastry chef. Mm -hmm. 
You had a degree. What, yes. what did you decide to do next? I interviewed with the Department of Education and became a school food service manager. I had three schools that I managed a cafeteria. I fed on a daily basis about 3,600 students. Now, where were these schools? These schools were in East New York. I was initially placed in Williamsburg, but I requested East New York because nobody wanted to go there, um, and I did. And so it was an easy transfer. I went to work in East New York, and I really enjoyed my job. Um, I was responsible for everything from ordering the food, managing the kitchen staff. Because in East New York, you had a lot of impoverished people. Correct. So, I mean, you had to feed these people. Yes. So this was a good program. It was. And it, it really spoke to who I was raised to be, which is someone that would always find a way to give back. And this was my way of giving back. I educated the children about the benefits of eating healthy and then hoped that they in turn would take that information home to their parents. And many of the children had no other way of getting food other than through the school food service program. So it gave me great pleasure and, uh, and a sense of fulfillment to do that job. So you did that for what, how long? A year, and then NYU came calling. What do you mean NYU came calling? <laughs> While I was working as a school food service manager, I enrolled part-time in the master's program at NYU in the School of Education. Uh, the degree is food service management. And I was part-time and uh, I applied to be a graduate teaching fellow. And they said, well, if you're going to be a graduate teaching fellow, that's a full-time study. Because I worked during the day helping the faculty with their grading and teaching. And then at night, I was a student. So what happened? You went full time? I went full time and I another year and I was done with my master's degree. And before graduation, I got offered a job to work for a company in New Jersey, D'Artagnan, on the Ariane Daguin and George Faison. Which was a, a food service Correct. company. Correct. The food service company. And I had the nutritional background and I also had my master's in food service management. So now we have a pastry chef with, a, uh, with an undergraduate degree, a master's degree. Then you get to the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce? Yes. <laughs> it just doesn't have food in it. Right. Okay? But how did Ken Adams and the team at the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce figure out what you should be doing next? Well, four years at D'Artagnan, and I left to start my own events management company. And uh, the Brooklyn Chamber called me with a three-week lead time to plan their annual dinner dance. And the way that food factored into my becoming a special events manager is that I could collaborate with the chefs to create the menus that I thought would work for the audience. And I wanted to have a say in how the food looked and the role that the food played at the event with the different caterers that we but were working But how do you have with. the involvement with the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce? Well, Kenneth hired me full time after organizing the annual dinner dance, and I stayed there for four years. But during that period of time, you were involved with member services. Member services and special events. Right. Yes. Okay, so you're at the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce when they were really growing. Yes. Okay, Ken Adams was a visionary. He really took an organization which was very quiet yes. and built the situation. And this was, this is in the early, what year? In 1999. 1999. 1999, yes. It's before Brooklyn became Brooklyn again. Correct. Okay, you know, it was quiet. The chamber was trying to work hard. Mm -hmm. But the, the problem about that is that there weren't that many uh, dy dynamic businesses in right. Brooklyn. Right. Brooklyn hadn't seen the new evolution over there. Correct. That. What happens next? Uh, I like to think actually that the work of the Brooklyn Chamber is what helped to make Brooklyn Brooklyn today because of the economic development uh, factor of what we did. And um, so after leaving the Brooklyn Chamber, I went to work for a member organization called Health Plus, which sells low and affordable health care. Health Plus does a great community service, which yes. you've been involved with community services. How do you find this opportunity, Health Plus? It was um, an opportunity to grow and uh, develop new so, skills. So you were trying to enroll members, or was that? Yes, I was responsible for the special events and marketing of Health Plus and the services that we provided to the community. So again, the community involvement. What services? Uh, low and affordable health insurance, 
And, uh, but we had to compete with so many other organizations that we had to stand out in the way we marketed ourselves, where we positioned our brand, uh, the organizations that we partnered with through sponsorship and uh, visibility in the communities. Now, when you were doing this, when were you thinking about the, the doctorate? Well, since leaving NYU, my last semester at NYU, I was offered a scholarship to go to either the dental school or to do a doctorate degree and I turned it down. Right. <laughs> I felt the need to work. I felt the need to become independent. My parents had been paying along with scholarship opportunities for my education and I really wanted to start you know, being more independent. So during the period of time from uh, the Brooklyn Chamber yes. and Health First. Health yeah, Plus. Health Plus. Yes. You had the opportunity to meet people at TD Bank. Correct? Yes, I did. So let's talk about how you transferred and changed your life going to TD Bank, which at that time was, were they called? Was Commerce Bank. Commerce Bank. Yes. Uh, while working at the chamber, I was recruiting members, and because we had so many new companies moving into the borough, I would get a chance to meet with these leaders and invite them to become members of the chamber and to help with the economic revitalization of Brooklyn. So in partnering with them, I met um, a few people who actually became mentors and friends and I, I now work with people like Greg Braca who is currently president and CEO of TD Bank, America's most convenient bank, Peter Meyer who is a New York City market president, um, Don Buckley who you know and works over in New Jersey as the market president and uh, so I got to partner with uh, with the bank they were working with at the time and they thought I stood out because when I called them they would take the call because they knew it was something that mattered to them. It wasn't just about them providing support for the chamber. I would tailor packages to their need and so when I called they would answer. So what happens? Peter or Greg or, who, or a combination of people decided that Commerce at that time needed some yeah. young young dynamic individual it was primarily peter meyer i was at health plus and i had taken a six-month maternity leave to have my son zachary and peter and i were having a conversation and he said there's an interesting role here at the bank and i think you'd be ideally so what was the first it. role it was a field marketing manager and it was an assistant vice president of field marketing what were the responsibilities? The primary responsibilities at that time was to oversee the grand opening, which we were expanding so rapidly. And my now um, manager, Jamie Triplett, and I would go across New York City, opening new locations, making sure that the bank looked, you know, everything looked really good for the grand opening and that we were sponsoring. So you, so you were a bank, but you were really a retail opener. Correct, okay? correct. You know, making sure that on, on Fridays that the banks, when they opened, because at that time the, the bank commerce, which they never called the branches branches, they were stores. Were stores, okay? yes. So, but it was the, the commerce brand, mm -hmm. and they built an unbelievable brand. Absolutely. Okay, in, in involving over that. When do you join commerce? I joined Commerce, oh God, I'm going, 13 years ago, which makes it 2005. So it's 2005, Commerce subsequently in 2000, and, uh, is it 10 years now? 10 years. 2008, Commerce is taken over by TD Bank. Correct. Canadians, one of the, yes. the largest bank in Canada mm -hmm. over there. What's the transition over the job changing over the period of time? Well, the beautiful thing is that TD Bank kept the culture of Commerce Bank. And so um, uh, we, I received um, a title change. I became vice president of U.S. Field Marketing Strategy. And over the years, uh, they st we started, of course, evolving as a bank because the way bank deal with, uh, connects with their customers has changed so dramatically. So when we became TD Bank, the role expanded and I became responsible for things like sponsorship budget and uh, connecting with the communities in which we live, work, and do business. And so the role just started to grow and grow. The department, the marketing department grew. Part of those initiatives were like the small business breakfasts. Correct, correct. And uh, working with our partners internally to provide services to our customers, teaching them how to expand their business, providing workshops and things like, you know, partnering with you and 1010 Wins for the small business breakfast series. Uh, I do the same at different lines of business, and it's just connecting our internal um, uh, folks with the community. So when do you decide to now take the opportunity to go for your PhD? Well, I actually did an EDD, which is a doctorate okay. in education. And um, 
I've always wanted to go back to school, but you know, life happened and then I was raising my son. And so when he was in elementary school, middle of elementary school, I decided, you know what, it's now or never because I don't want to be in school when he's in high school and needs all of my focus and all of my energies and all of my attention. What actually made me do it at that time is that my son was diagnosed as, uh, as uh, having what I would best explain to people as internal ADD. It's an executive function um, uh, issue where he thinks faster than he can possibly, you know, keep up with writing or speaking. And so his mind is always at work. He's a very busy young man, very bright. And uh, I realized quickly that public school was not meeting his needs. Tried as hard as they could, and he went to one of the best public schools in New York City, but he just was not a happy student. And so I started investigating how I could help him best as his mother and how best to advocate for him. And that led me to think about, well, you know, in order to do that well, I need to go back to school to take a few courses to learn how to do that. And so I said, well, why not now? So when did you start taking the courses again? I started in 2012, right after Hurricane Sandy, my first class. I remember going to school and this class was canceled and I was upset because I wasted a gas, my precious gas to get to the campus and there was right. no school. So the fall of 2012. And you received your EED when? My EDD in May of 2018. So I spent five years toiling away at that degree. Now, you, when you got that degree, you wrote a letter. I remember reading some, type, you were honored for some award or something, and you were talking about education, your son. Talk to me about that. Yes. Um, what, I, what I realized and recognized, you know, in, with my son is that from K through 12, a lot of students who learn differently have support. Once they leave high school, that support falls off dramatically because unless you self-identify in college, then there, are, there is very little support for you. Not every college is set up with the kind of services that students like my son will need to be successful. And I think we, um, we underestimate how many students may have some form of um, learning, I don't like to call it disability, but learn differently. And so they go to college, they take these huge student debts and they start to fail. So um, my doctorate degree focused primarily on how to help these students to overcome these limitations and to be more successful. And that to me speaks more, more than just helping the students because all of us should be concerned with student outcome. Corporations who are going to hire these students later, you who will have to encounter these students on the subway or in your line of business later. So we need to ensure that we have students that are going to be successful. Now you also each year participate and honor in Black History Month. I do. Um, my son is American and um, I'm raising him in a culture where um, everyone doesn't recognize and appreciate black history. They see it as a history belonging only to black people. And I put forward that black history is American history because we have uh, shared experiences and the way that um, the culture is, is positioned is not always in a positive light. So I didn't have the benefit of, a, of an education here in the United States, so I have had to study myself about black American history and American history in general and learn about the struggles and the civil rights movement and the Jim Crow era. All of that I had to study so that I could teach him and his brother, um, you know, my stepson, on which I was gifted through me through marriage. So talk to me about your son and your stepson. Well, I call them my sons and I say my, my son Jaden, the older of the two, is right. now 18 years old. He goes to Zavarian High School. And my son Zachary, who's now 13, goes to Mary McDowell Friends School in Brooklyn. And I'm raising the boys together. Um, I want them to have shared experiences. I want them to be able to lean on each other. And I want them to know that they're never alone, but that they can have the support of family the way I did. I had all my siblings to this day who root for me and they're my biggest advocates and I need them to understand that they have that if nothing else they can you know support each other and be there for each other in, in addition to the siblings and the the family you also mentioned a mentor yes one of my mentors, Norma Sinclair, is my uh, best friend from college, her mother, and she was one of our teachers and college in Jamaica, yes, a college of arts, science, and technology. The first day of school, she said to me, um, what are you going to do when you grow up, you know? And I said, well, 
I want to be a, a food service manager, I want to work with food, and I didn't quite know. And she said, I think you're going to be a teacher. And she had known me for a few months at that point. And I said, ugh, teaching, never. And we laughed. And she said, don't laugh. You will acquire skills through your lifetime. And based on how you interact with people, she said, I think there's a teacher somewhere in there. And so my dissertation is in part dedicated to her because I think she's probably one of the first people to ever even suggest to me that I could be a teacher, even without being in the classroom, but that I would have in some capacity a teaching. So what about teaching in the classroom? I like teaching in the classroom. I've been an adjunct faculty member both at NYU and New York City College of Technology. And this year I'm teaching a course called Professional Alliances. It's one night a week and I'm an adjunct faculty member there. You're still involved in, with a number of charities. Tell me about some of them. Yes. I sit on the foundation board at New York City College of Technology. I'm a member there. And I was until recently president of the Brooklyn Center for the Performing Arts. And I gave up my, um, my role as president back in April and the organization has since closed but um, I also get involved with uh, the YMCA and uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters there are a number of nonprofit organizations that we bank and partner with that call on me for information and recommendations and uh, to be a subject matter expert so, so as you said before when somebody said to you what do you want to do when you grow up what do you want to do when you grow up Wow I want to do something that impacts the lives of our students, whether it's investigating um, what makes them successful. For example, um, I investigated the Black Male Initiative program, which by the way is open to all students at CUNY, and the role it plays in student success through mentoring and uh, teaching them how to network, uh, providing experiences as faculty assistants, and the Folks that go through this program are more successful than students who don't. And the data that I collected and uh, research shows that with support, students can graduate. It may take them a little bit longer to get to the graduation line, but they do get there, make them better prepared in society than we're doing today. I'm very fortunate to have you as a guest. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much.